Hello everyone from 2nd and 5th Hour World History. Uh, today we are going to get into our third installment of World War I. Uh, this video is going to be split up into two parts for this lecture. Uh, our focus in the previous lectures had been the start of World War I, uh, and then we also went into the type of warfare, where it was fought, and the technology on the second day. Uh, so today we are going to get to what happened after the war. Uh, we know that the Allies win the war. Uh, an armistice is signed on November 11th of 1918. And now terms have to be decided about what is going to happen to Europe after this great war that was unlike anything that they had ever seen. Now, for those of you that are interested in the history of World War II, uh, this is probably the most important part of what you will learn uh, about World War II as far as why it started. So it starts truly here with the end of World War I. So very important to understand what happens here to really understand the motives by, behind many of the people in World War II. So let's get into this. Now naturally at the end of a war the first thing everyone associates with and how bad it was is you start looking at you know death tolls and the great war was more deadly and destructive than any war in history to that date and you're talking nine to ten million military and, and we have estimates that range with the whole population fifteen to twenty two million total deaths uh... with an additional twenty one to twenty three million wounded people or casualties as they would say and the war was costly, $350 billion back in 1918, not today's money. Uh, as a result of this, a byproduct was that European countries had to tax their citizens more and put them in financial strife. Uh, trade was slow to get out of the gate after the war because so many businesses were lost. Uh, the amount of people, the economy had completely changed. Uh, and then on top of it, the destruction created millions of people in Europe that didn't have homes anymore. And there was refugees. So this truly was like unlike anything that anyone had ever experienced before. And as we talked about going into the war, what the mood was where people were positive and excited about this being the war to end all wars. By the time it was done, they wanted to be the war that ended all wars. Um, absolutely blew their mind what this had done to the world as they had known it uh, and the impact was evident uh, going forward. Now uh, we start looking at even the death tolls by country here and we see the two countries that took the greatest uh, tolls uh, were on the Eastern Front with Germany and Russia. Germany almost had 2 million people. Russia was at 1.7. And the crazy thing about Russia is we know they got out a year early. What would those numbers look like if they had stayed in? Uh, and most of Europe uh, experienced high, high casualties. British had a million. Uh, the, uh, we're looking at France, 1.5 million. I mean, just big, big numbers across the board. Italy, almost half a million. And then we look at the United States. And the United States, as we know, entered at the last minute. Uh, and we still lost 115,000 people. You know, when we stack that up against wars that have gone on much longer in U.S. history, that's a pretty incredible number that it, that many people lost their lives that fast. So, uh, some other after effects that we were introduced to with warfare after this. Uh, one of the worst problems because of the Western Front and the muddy terrain and it constantly being wet was the fact that these soldiers didn't have enough supplies to change your socks or get out of the boots and some of them developed a uh, diagnosis known as trench foot uh, and the cold damp conditions if you didn't change your boots you didn't change your shoes eventually your your foot began to crack and, and start to cane uh, and it, it got bad to the point where to stop this from spreading uh, you would have to have eventual amputation. So think of it along the lines in many ways like a, a situation like gangrene. Uh, on top of it as well, things that um, you know, come with warfare, and we know this now, but back then they didn't know. Uh, they called it shell shock. Uh, boys came home, they, they, 
they weren't the same. Uh, the mind is a is is a device, and you know, war breaks the mind of some people that it needs to be repaired. And for some people, it, it it's unrepairable, and it's sad to say. But there was a lot of men that came home that just had trouble functioning in regular society anymore because they had experienced so many traumatic things that they had seen or been a part of. Uh, and, and eventually their mind gave in and people didn't know at that time what to do uh, to help these these poor men and, and people that have had this. On top of it, there was a lot of disfigurement. We start seeing kind of early forms of plastic surgery. Uh, you know, one common thing is if you had a, a basically a major uh, injury to the face uh, and you wanted to go in public, you know, maybe your eye was blown out, uh, they would create masks and people would paint these masks that you would wear that would strap onto the back of your head to try to match up with the other side of your face uh, so it would work. But a lot of the amputees, a, a lot of people came back, you know, they didn't die, but um, they left a lot on that battlefield uh, of their previous lives that they never got back. And then adding insult to injury, soldiers come back, war is over, and then an influenza epidemic like one we have not seen hits in 1918 and 1919 and devastates the world. And it started on the Western Front. So can you attribute it to World War I? Uh, you could make a case for it because a lot of these soldiers unwillingly you know, brought it home, uh, spread it to other people. Uh, and it was a tough go. Uh, it spread around the world in multiple waves. Uh, you know, and eventually, in a year or so, killed about 30 million people. And you know, there's little things that we look at. You look at the uh, the chart down here um, of the waves, and got something that we've uh, become accustomed to with what we're dealing with is kind of flattening the curve. Uh, and if you look down here at the chart, the influenza pandemic. Uh, you're really looking at that curve at the end of 1918 between October and November were really the peak months uh, as far as deaths uh, when it hit. And then you see a second wave there at the end in March of 1919. So multiple waves, as we said, uh, 30 million people on top of the amount of millions of people that died from the war itself. So, pretty crazy. And there's a little poems here, like it says here. I had a little bird, and its name was Enza. I opened the window, and influenza. Yeah, that's pretty bad. But, stuff that was out there. Now, we're going to stop here, because I'll run out of time if I try to combine both uh, of these parts of the lecture. Uh, we're going to break into the most important peace conference, and in a lot of ways of flawed peace conferences that history can remember uh, that had devastating results moving forward for Europe. And that was the Paris Peace Conferences for World War I and the Treaty of Versailles. So we're going to close out part one and we are going to jump to part two.